Hello. Hello. Thank you all for coming uh, to this presentation here at the Ashland Senior Center. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I work at Myrick O'Connell. I do elder law. Nothing but Myrick O'Connell. We have offices in Worcester, um, Westboro, and Boston. Uh, there are 70 of us. I'm in Westboro, and the reason why I get to do this is because it's a multi-specialty law firm. So everybody else does something else, and I just do this. So the reason why I do these presentations usually is to be spending a lot of time talking about all of the issues that Frank and Mary need to face, uh, legal issues, during the rest of their lives. Um, but I tried this fall to do two um, presentations. This is the second one, dealing with... Frank and Mary kind of more holistically. The last presentation, you may recall, some of you were here, we talked about Frank and Mary when they were 70, and what their issues are, with Frank and Mary when they were 80. And I had a set of people here, so I have a set of people today too, because we're going to be talking about um, Frank and Mary not when Frank, they are 70 or 80, but Mary when she's 90. And Mary at this point has outlived her husband. Frank's dead. Mary's um, trying to figure out how the rest of her life is going to work out. We have a set of people to talk about that. We have Dr. Michelle Ricard, a wonderful geriatric uh, geriatric who is now retired, but you know, they never retire, right? So they're working, right? So she's here doing this stuff because this is the work that she did all of her life as a doctor was dealing with these kinds of issues, right? We have Sarah Burke, who was here last time, an Ashland person actually lives here, uh, but as, as a geriatric care manager, as we talked about, those are folks that are really trying to help you as a, as a senior whatever you're trying to deal with, figure out how to deal with it. What are all the pieces? Um, we have my, my, my friend Doug Pack from Seniors Helping Seniors, a home care entity that actually um, employs nothing but seniors, right, to help seniors. And so in the early days with Frank and Mary, 70 at 70, he was looking to have them work for him so that he could work with seniors. So now we're going to be talking about those seniors helping folks like Mary in the last years. Uh, and my friend Christine Alessandro, who, who is the executive director of Bay Path Elder Services. Many of you have heard of Bay Path. It's the state, it's the, the nonprofit that covers this and, and 13 other communities as the vehicle through which all federal and state money for seniors comes. So her program, the programs that she does or is connected with are like all of the programs that are state or federally funded programs to so talk about these issues. So to start off, we're going to have Mary. And here's Mary, and she's 90. And as we talked about the last time, when Frank and Mary were, when Frank was uh, 70, he had 14 years to live as his actuarial life expectancy. And he was 80, he had three, eight, eight years. And he didn't make it. He didn't make it through his eight years because now he's dead. Mary, um, when she was 70, had 16 years of life expectancy. And when she was 80, had almost 10. Uh, and she did make it. So now she's 90, but she has 4.85 years of actuarial life expectancy left. Now, she may live longer than that, right? Some people live to 100. But ask yourself, now honestly, you live in Ashland, how many people do you know that are over 90? Now, how many people do you know who are over 100, right? So there are a lot of people that go during that middle period, right? So we're gonna figure that Mary at this point had saved the money that Frank and Mary had so that she still has their assets. She has a house worth 300,000. She has savings of 200,000. She has an IRA. Um, worth 300000 so she's got total assets that are pretty substantial, and she's got only Social Security for income other than the money she makes off the IRA of the savings account. And her goals have, are the same as hers and Frank's were. She wants to live in her house until she dies. She wants to be buried in the backyard. She wants to not run out of money before she dies. That's really important, right? A lot of people, like, you get to worry about that, right? Um, she wants to leave the rest to their kids, and she wants to sleep well at night. That's all. She's not looking for fame and fortune, right? So the question is, you know, how is she going to deal with that? When she's talking to me, uh, I'll be, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, she's going to be, I'm going to be asking her, you know, kind of, what, you, know, you know, what are your assets that are left? Did you put them in trust? And there are a couple of reasons to put them in trust, and we'll talk about that later. Um, and what are the kinds of assets that there are? Because she may want, be wanting to put them in trust because of this possibility of needing nursing home care later on, or just in order to make it more convenient for her kids after she dies. So Mary, at this point, has got about five years' worth of actuarial life expectancy. She doesn't know how long it is. She just knows that she's got some, and she knows that it ends. It ends when she dies. Probably, 
there's going to be a period before she dies where she's going to be having, where she's not going to be feeling so great, right? That is kind of one of the things that has changed from when we and I were growing up. When you, most people died because they had a stroke or they died. And they had a heart attack or they died. And the statistic that, that I always use is that, is that in 1970, if you had a heart attack or a stroke, your chances of just dying within 14 days were 33%. They are now 3%. You can, you're not going to feel as great after you had that heart attack or that stroke, right? You're going to be less strong, um, but you're probably not going to be dying. So for Mary, it's all about being as healthy as she can be and kind of figuring that out, about being prepared to be sick and about being ready to die. So we're going to start off about talking about the being healthy as she can be and being prepared to be sick. And then in the second part of this presentation, we're going to talk about Mary if she was looking at another year of life and she knew that the dying was kind of on the horizon. By the way, I'm, I'm delighted that, frame, that uh, Ashland Cable replays these shows because so many of the people that need to, or are thinking about this a lot, are at home right now. Are at home right now. So they need to be see, you know, seeing this presentation. So um, uh, in these, in the, I'm re going to be referring to a wonderful book by a woman named Katie Butler, B-U-T-L-E-R. It's in the end of my presentation. I'm going to tell you, buy this book, right? It's called it's called The Art of Dying Well, and she divides it into chapters, and each chapter she says at the beginning, this chapter would be very relevant to you if the following rings, any of these ring a bell. And so in her third chapter called Adaptation, this is what might ring a bell. You know you're not going to get better. The way you're feeling is the new normal. You're not going to be getting better. Uh, people have, that have helped you in the past, right, or people that you've helped in the past, now they're more or less helping you, right? You're needing some assistance. You've got a cane. You've got a walker. You're not getting around great. Um, you need help doing chores at home, right? I mean, you're still saying that you want it, you do them, but, you know, it just kills you to do them. You really need some help at home. Um, your health conditions are no longer an annoyance. They've changed how you live. And you sometimes worry that you're just exhausting your family members, you know, typically that daughter or son or even your spouse who is just killing himself because you're having some issues. So that's who you are. So before we, I ask Sarah to talk about the geriatric care manager's role in this case, I wanted Dr. Ricard to speak to this. Because, you know, that's the nice thing about your geriatrician, right? You'd see him every year, right? Sometimes you get to be our age more than every year, right? And so she or he is constantly talking to you about these issues. So I wanted Dr. Ricard to just kind of talk about people in this situation and what their concerns are and what she would talk to them about. Dr. Ricard. Thank you. Oh, you need. Who's retired? I don't like. Oh, retired Is that any better? No, you just need to kind of talk loud, loud, doctor. That's all. That won't help. This is this isn't connected to your speaker system. It's connected to the camera. Ah. Okay. Uh, no, so you may want to just get closer to them. Then that's you can do that too. All right, and I don't have a good project, projecting voice, so. So I was asking, who in this room, I, I hate the word retirement, I'm still trying to figure out uh, an alternative word for it, because now that I am, I don't like it, the word retirement, I mean, uh, repurpose maybe, or something, anyway. Um, so who in this room is retired? Okay, and so that leaves a couple of people. Um, so who is in the last five or ten years of their regular career job? All right. <laughs> Uh, anybody else? Okay, so the good news is that what we want to do today is to make you realize that you have control over what happens to you. And you can start thinking about the what's going to happen when you're 90 uh, or in the last year of your life. You can start thinking about it now, no matter how old you are. Um, so I thought we would um, develop a little list of things that when you are in that last year, when that happens, what are the sorts of things that you would like to make sure that you have done or that are happening in that last year? So, I can't do that and do this at the same time. I don't know how we're going to do this, but... Um, 
Ah, you want, you want Sarah to write for you? Write. Oh, sure. And that way you can still OK, have all right, there we go. Always ways around these things. <laughs> Adaptation, <laughs> right? Here, we're a great team. <laughs> Um, so does anybody have any ideas of what they would like to have in that last year of life? Make sure all your wills are and everything. Okay, so wills, okay. Um, I had put down here, I would like in my last year to still be able to have a cup of tea with my friends. So I would still like to be able to converse and to have tea. I'm a, I'm a tea drinker. Um, but you can substitute coffee. Um, any, other, any other thoughts of what you would like to have in that last year? I'd like to still be able to participate in my yoga class. Excellent. Yoga or physical therapy or, or some kind of physical exercise stuff. What, no matter, who here does, um, does yoga? Excellent. Anybody do Tai Chi? All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, regular. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so anything, those things are very good, by the way, to do because they help you maintain your balance so that you don't fall and you don't fracture, which are things that you don't want to have in the last year of your life. Um, any other things that you can think of that you would like to have in that last year? Let's say... Uh, time with Excellent. Okay, time with friends. Or family, excellent. <coughs> Some people say that they would just like to be around so that they can see outside or be connected to what's happening outside. Fall foliage, for example. You know, if you're stuck indoors in a nursing home or something, you don't always get to see the outdoors. So, weather um, being outside. Um, how about? Health is, so I'm sorry, go ahead. Dignity. Dignity. Dignity not to suffer. Not to suffer, okay. Very <laughs> All right. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, health, does that ring a bell with anybody that they would like to make sure that they are, are as healthy as they can be? Yeah. The, the one important thing about health, it is not the absence of disease. So, Everybody who gets to 90 has something. In fact, as a geriatrician, I used to tell my students that unless they could list 10 diagnoses, they hadn't done a proper history and physical. Everybody has something. A little arthritis, a little thinning bones, a little skin stuff, you know, this little something. And then, of course, there's diabetes and hypertension and all those other things. But it doesn't mean that you can't feel healthy. <clears throat> so I think this is a very good list. Um, you want to be as healthy as you can. Um, now, <clears throat> there are some things that, you, so these are some of the things you can control, and there are some things that you can't control. Um, for example, you, nobody knows when the last year is going to be, and unexpected medical issues do happen, and you really can't control where your family goes to. For example, I've got kids scattered in three different states. I'm not really close to any of them, um, but it would be nice to have family close, but you can't dictate you know, where your kids and grandchildren go. Um, so what I want you to take away today is that you do have control, and we're going to show you how you have control through things that I think we'll mention later, like a healthcare proxy and a MOLST form. Um, and talking to your doctor and talking to your caregivers when that time comes. Um, so as you can see, I think these, this list of what you want in that last year really has to do with quality of life. So we're not talking about wanting to live another year or another 10 years. You, obviously, we want to live as long as we can, but we want to have quality. We want to be able to have... Um, to do the yoga. We want to be able to talk with friends and family. And, and we want to have our dignity respected. We want to have our wishes respected. So we talk now, as a geriatrician, I would talk about quality of life, not quantity. I mean, obviously, we all want as much as we can get, but we want, we want the quality is what's important. Um, <clears throat> so um, 
in the book that Arthur mentioned, uh, Katie's book, she references a 2017 poll in which, she's, which they polled what, um, what people wanted. Um, and a quarter of the people wanted to live as long as possible, no matter what. 25% said that. But 75% were focused on the quality of life. Um, they didn't want to be a burden. They, uh, they, didn't, um, they, they wanted to die at home. They didn't want to have any pain. And they wanted spiritual peace. <coughs> but what's interesting is that 100% of people wanted to say in it. And this is, this is what we want to, you know, tell you that you, you need to be, get everything in place so that you can have a say in this. Um, so I think you need to make sure that your um, physical health is as best as it can, your mental health is as good as it can be, and your spiritual health is as good as it can be. Um, so I would be remiss if I didn't say that physical health includes things not just yoga and tai chi but also what you eat and there is a increasing data now really supportive of eating more fruits and vegetables um, does anybody here eat um, red meat or has or who is who anyone who's given up red meat at this point okay very good very good okay um, so the more whole food plant-based food that you can get into you, your body will be healthier for it. That's a topic, another, another topic, but it will help you with any diabetes, it'll help you with hypertension, it will help you with cholesterol, and it'll help you with weight. Um, and all these things are going to make you be as healthy as you can, because you want to get into your last year, we're, we're all heading there, but we want to be as healthy as we can. We, we can't change what our what God has given us for bodies and our genetics, we can't change. But we can help that body to function the best that it can. And I think this is, this is the goal now. It doesn't matter whether you start at <coughs> 40 or you start at 80, or it doesn't matter when you start. You can still make positive changes. Um, so on the, on, the, on the mental health side of things, we've got you know, mind, body, and spirit. So we talked about the body, on the mind. Um, socialization, very important. So you need to make sure that, and you coming here, you're, you're socializing, which is, which is good. You have a, a group that you know, people that you can talk with about problems. Um, so as we get older, we, this companionship and socialization is very, very important. Um, spirituality is, is important, whether that's a, an official church group or whatever higher being you, you, know, you follow. Um, exercise is also important for the mind because is there, um, anyone who's done some aerobic exercise will tell you how much better they feel afterwards. You're more alert, your mind is clearer, you start thinking better. Yeah, you might have sore muscles, but uh, you will feel better. Um, getting outdoors. Um, we talked about the connection with, with family. Um, so by the time you reach 90, um, you need to have focused on these things, and, but then you need to tell people about it. And that's what we're going to get into with telling people what your wishes are. Telling people that you want, you know, in your last years of life, these are the things you want. It's, I mean, it's great that you know it, but your doctor needs to know it. And as a geriatrician, I want to know that. And um, any other person that's involved with your health needs to know it, caregivers, geriatric case managers, they, they need to know these things. Um, so you've got to tell people. And so, like I said, this is going to, we're going to be talking about, I think, healthcare proxies and most forms, but these are things, you know, that, that you need to do. Um, so, it's, um, it's, it sounds a little grim to be talking about the last years of your life, but there's, um, I think of it as a, something that you can enjoy. Um, enjoy, what, enjoy the things that you still can't do. Don't regret the things that, you know, you can't do anymore. 
realize what you can do. What you can do may get less and less, but you're still going to find enjoyment in doing it. So That's great. Okay. That's great. <clears throat> Dr. Ricard came in very stressed out because she was like, so what am I going to say exactly? <laughs> right. Doc, she just so gets it. So I'm just going to just, just only, one, only, only one addendum that I wanted to, uh, to have Sarah Burke talk about the kind of many things that you can kind of do in those years. And so, I, so we have, we had a good, I have a good friend whose wife died of ovarian cancer mm, four years ago. Oh, no, when she died, she was cancer free. When she died, she was cancer free because she spent two years doing chemotherapy, right? But the chemotherapy killed her. And in the meantime, she just had the most terrible two years. She was constantly nauseous. It was just terrible. But to the end, she continued to want to extend her life. So I, t I get it. There are, there are people who can never get over how frightening it is, how frightening it is to actually have to die, right? And, so that, and, that, and that may be your goal, because I'm not telling you what the right goal is. Right? That may be your goal, but you, but you, you need to be figuring out, as doc, Dr. Ricard said, it's your life. They're your goals. You need to decide what you want, and if they change, that's okay too, and then you need to make sure that the people around you who are there to try to help you can help you to your goal, not to their goal. So Sarah, can we talk about what a geriatric care manager, what you would be doing, what would you be talking to, about sure. to Mary at 90? A lot of what we do is have some of those or start some of those difficult conversations. So what are your goals? How, how is life working now? Um, you know, we're thinking about Mary, who's now 90. Her husband has passed away. She's in the big house that she raised Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. in. They're out in California, all three of them. She's alone. Um, she had been married for 50 some odd years, 60 some odd years, and she's lonely. And it's harder for her to get around. Walking is harder, her arthritis, she has the cane, sometimes she needs the walker, she can't drive anymore, getting to the supermarket becomes an issue. She has to ask her friends or her neighbors to pick things up. Um, doing the laundry is harder because it's downstairs. Um, you know, so getting up and down the stairs, Oh, sorry, can't hear. Sorry. So getting up and down stairs is difficult for the, for the laundry. Um, and she's lonely. You know, she lives in this house down a dirt road. So some of what I would always start off with is, well, what do you want your life to look like? Now, I know she set out with this goal of living in her house until she died and being buried in her backyard, but her goals might have changed. So it's a conversation about, is this what you want to do? So yes, she still wants to live at home. So it's a matter of thinking about, well, what can we bring into your home to give you joy, to make things easier for you? There are different kinds of companions. Uh, Doug Peck will talk perhaps a little bit about that, or he did last time. Um, there are the traditional ones that will help you bathe, that will do your laundry, make your meals, clean up the house. There are also non-traditional ones that are really meant as companions so that you're matched with someone who has common interests. And that way you can, you know, they might take you out to a movie or to a show or just shopping somewhere or a craft store or whatever it is that brings you joy to your yoga class. If you can't get there on your own, I might con connect you with somebody who can do that. In addition, probably at 90, Mary's health is getting more complex. There may be more doctors involved and more decisions to make. So I would go with Mary to these meetings, to the doctor's appointments, listen, and have conversations with her. The you know, Art talked about the, her, his friend with the chemotherapy, but was terribly sick. I would be having that conversation. What is more important to you? Do you want to feel well and not have this constant nausea and fatigue and, and horribleness? Or are you ready to stop doing the chemo? So yes, your life might be a little bit shorter, but you might enjoy it more. What's important to you? There are various, um, pa there's various ways to have that conversation. There's a, a program called Honoring Choices that has a whole um, paperwork where you can go through and ask questions. What's important to you? What are your values? 
what do you what do you want to keep doing so i might have that conversation with you so that i can also support you in making sure that everybody knows those are your wishes i think sometimes when you go to a doctor it can be a little intimidating because they just want to make you better or keep treating you and you might be ready not to do that so as a care manager i might help speak up for that um i think that's that, I think that's about it. Uh, yeah, that's it for me. <laughs> okay. That's it for me. So now, Doug. Can I have a clicker? Oh, thanks. One more. One more. So I'm going to take a little bit deeper dive uh, in, into what we just talked about. Uh, as a matter of fact, Sarah and I were just at a conference all day yesterday that talked about bioethics and end-of-life care. And uh, two things stood out. One in particular was how complicated it is nowadays. It's not as simple anymore uh, as, as it used to be. You have a lot of choices in what's going on, not just about when you're, when you're dying, but when you, when you get sick and you can't do a lot of the things and it's gonna be terminal, and what happens when you do become uh, incapacitated. So this is Mary's other goal. You remember the other goal is, how do I make the best of this situation that I'm in? And I think that's the right question to ask is this is this, you know, you can sugarcoat it, the situation if you want, but the better you understand your situation, which is why you need to have frank conversations with your, geriatri your geriatrician, or if you don't have a geriatrician, your, your PCP is, so what is the real state of my health? If I do this, what's gonna happen? If I don't do this, what's gonna happen? And there's not gonna, they're not gonna be able to give you a guarantee but they're gonna give you some more information because that's how you understand your situation is by getting real information about the state of your health and what this means in general. So she's gonna to try to make the, the, uh, you know, the best of the situation and you're gonna to try to, so we're gonna ask the question, who's in control? Who controls the quality of your life? Well, like Dr. Ricard said, you can't control what illnesses you're going to get, but you can control other things about it, and particularly how you're going to respond to the situation that you're in. Are you going to respond negatively? Are you going to try to extend it as long as possible? Or are you going to do uh, some other different things? And the real question is, <clears throat> excuse me, the first one is, and, and Art's going to talk about this a little bit further, is you can control something very important if you are seriously ill. And that's the person who's going to make these decisions for you. And this is something that you really need to give a lot of thought to. And we're going to go into it a little bit more because they, they're going to represent you legally to the doctors in the hospital or the doctors in general. That's what their job is going to be. And they will have legal control over your, uh, over what kind of treatment you get um, once, once they assume uh, control of it. So um, there's, this is where the, the real medical treatment is where it does get complicated and you really need to understand what things like life support means. You know, what does that mean? And when we look at a most form and some of the other newer forms that are out, it goes into some detail here. You know, I want my doctor to stop giving me life support if it's not helping my health conditions or symptoms. Well, what does that mean? None of these are really, I don't say none, but most, right, are not necessarily black and white. There, there are shades of gray. So you need to have some discussions about if I stop it, what does this mean? Will, will it cause me to die in 10 minutes? Would it cause me to die in a week? What's going to happen? So on, you know, these are not you know, fun questions to ask, but it's really information that you need to start off with. But you're thinking about this now while you're, while you're relatively healthy and you're not in a crisis. As soon as you're in a health crisis, a lot of this stuff tends to go away because you just are not prepared mentally to have these conversations and to be thinking about this. I just have a question. So I'm power of attorney for my parents and my husband is power of attorney for my mom. 
but they're still able to make the decisions. Is there some kind of paperwork you have to do, like, like for instance, one of our parents went to the hospital and the doctor wanted that person to stay for some testing, and they didn't want to stay, even though you're the power of attorney and you think, you know, you have a heart condition and you should stay for observation overnight. If they don't want to stay, they, they, you couldn't make I'm going to let the the uh, the uh, the lawyer answer that, not me. <laughs> that that and as soon as they they are considered to not be able to make the decision as soon as their doctor says, and if their doctor doesn't say in writing that they're incapable of making a medical decision, then they're in total control. This the 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 healthcare proxy statute. Uh, leans very strongly in favor of you, the person who is writing the healthcare proxy, in terms of we're never going to take any power to make a decision away from you until your doctor says that you literally don't have the capacity to make it. You have every right to make stupid decisions, at least decisions that I think are stupid, because they're not stupid to you, right? And we're all free here. This is America. This is, there's nothing wrong with that presumption that you can make stupid decisions, right? And, and I, I think that's really important. Right? That's sure. just, it, it can be really dumb, but I, but I, but I want to follow up with questions at the end just because we're going to run a little close. This is the first time we've tried this presentation, so I have no idea how the timing here works. <clears throat> Doug, you have a minute. <laughs> don't laugh. You've used my time. Okay. One is, again, people don't necessarily think about it. They think about the medical aspects, the legal aspects, but something like this. How comfortable do you want to be? Do you want your favorite music played if you were in a hospital room? You know, uh, what is your favorite music? How would you like it played? I want to, and this is being very specific, I want to have warm baths often and kept fresh and clean at all times. I, I know how difficult that can be. My, my mother was in a skilled nursing facility for the last uh, eight or nine months of her life, and I know at times when she didn't feel like that. I know at times that my sister would bring, would do a manicure for her, would, you know, on a regular basis, have her hair done still, because that was important to her. And, you know, she, she understood what her wishes were like that. She was just that kind of a person. She liked to get dressed every day, have makeup on, even though she was still in bed. So these are the type of things that you can think about and be very, and talk about with the person who is your healthcare proxy, because they are controlling this. I'm going to run over in a minute. Um, I want people, how do you want people to treat you? I want people uh, to be cared for with kindness and cheerfulness and not sadness. I want to have people of my faith community come visit me if I'm sick. I want people in, I want to see people have friends come in my, come in the room <clears throat> and, and talk to me. And some people might say, I don't want that. I want to be left alone. But you have to be, you have to be thinking about these types of things and be specific. Another one is, what do you want your loved ones to know? You know, I, I wish to be forgiven for all the times that I hurt my family, friends, and others. For some people, that's important. I want memories of my, of my life to give my family and friends joy and not sorrow. I, you know, uh, I, want to, I wish to have my friends and family know that I love them. Being very specific about these things. It's a whole other element, but, you know, we're, we're human beings. We're not just, we're just not our disease. And you have feelings and there's, you've, have, you've had a, you have complex family relationships that everybody does. Here's a time to sort of begin to sort those out if that really makes you uh, feel better. One is, one, another one, for example, I wish to have my hand held and be talked to when possible, even if I don't respond. So um, this I take from a, and I, I, I have this in the, the handouts, a thing called five wishes. Um, I've modified it a little bit. I'll pass these around as well. We got these at our seminar yesterday. The, it's called the Go Wish Game. And you can, pass, you can take a look at them and pass them around. There are 36 cards that say, um, I, I would I, they have this type of thing on the cards. And what you do is you say, you make three piles. One that's important to me, one that's maybe important but not necessary, and one that I don't care a lot about. So it's a way to stimulate your thinking about this because it is hard to sit down and say, I have 20 things that I want done to me. I mean, I couldn't pull up, pull up things like that. But if you have, you have somebody that's jogging your memory and saying, oh, yeah, I would like to have 
my friends come in if I'm sick or I'm towards the end. That's important to me because they've been friends for so long. Or I would like this kind of music played. So I'm getting off right now, I think. That's the resources. They're in, they're in this, uh, uh, th what you have. So you'll be able to uh, take a look at them if you need them as well. Thanks. So I'll introduce Christine. One, two. One, two. You don't get those. I just want to mention, so, uh, but a lot of this is directly relevant because it's, it's really relevant to what happens in the last year of your life because you may find yourself in a position where you can't be talking about a lot of those things in that last year. So getting, it, getting a lot of these decisions talked about early is really important. So I'm Christine Alessandro. I'm the executive director of Bay Path Elder Services. I was here last time. I think I was here last time in short sleeves, and now it's in a turtleneck and wool. So big change in the weather. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of how to stay home when Mary is 90, because Mary still wants to be buried in the backyard where Frank already is. She doesn't want to go to a nursing home. She doesn't want to keep going in and out of the hospital, but the kids are on the West Coast, and we all know that daughters are generally the, the children who will come and take care of a mother. That's statistically proven. So what might Mary be able to do? Well, if Mary attended these sessions and she was paying attention to Arthur, she'd be on Mass Health by now. Okay, so all of her assets are protected. And if Mary is on Mass Health, she would be eligible for a program called the Choices Program in the State Home Care Program. Now, in the State Home Care Program, there are three levels of service. First is Home Care Basic, where you get three hours of homemaking or two hours of homemaking and meals on wheels a week. The next level up is called the Enhanced Community Options Program, or ECOP. That's for people who are not on Mass Health but are clinically eligible for a nursing home. And the last is choices, folks who are clinically eligible for a nursing home and are on mass health. So as you can see, you have an increasing level of service as you become more frail through the state home care program. We can coordinate services with palliative care and hospice care. You don't have, a, have to have either one or the other. So if you have hospice care in your home, your, your hospice service will have a home health aide come in, they will have a nurse come in, but they're not going to have necessarily someone to come in and do your laundry. So that's where service coordination comes about. So it enables you to stay home with a good quality of life, but still have that multitude of services and maintain your dignity. On a choices program, you do need informal supports to have a backup plan. So I will share that I'm a caregiver for my mother who lives in New Jersey, and this is something that we're thinking about now. Who's going to be the backup plan for mom because mom is aging in place at the age of 87? Somebody needs to be close by. Who is it going to be? So the Choices Program, you need to be on the Frail Elder Waiver. A waiver is something that the state gets from the federal government that says, we can waive certain criteria under Medicaid to allow you to be eligible. So to be on the frail elder waiver, you need to be over the age of 60, meet, meaning state home care criteria, which I just talked about on the previous slide. You must be a Mass Health Standard member, enrolled in or eligible for the waiver program. Your service plan needs to be at least two times the level of state home care. So you're looking at approximately $700 worth of service a month. You must need and receive a waiver program service and be at imminent risk for nursing facility placement and meet one of the following four criteria. Again, I said this is the nuts and bolts. This is the technical stuff. So the criteria, actively seeking nursing facility placement within the last six months. Within the last 30 days, experienced a serious medical event. Did you fall and break a hip? Did you fall and have a traumatic brain injury? You were discharged from a nursing facility in the last 30 days, or you are at risk of nursing facility admission due to instability or lack of capacity of informal 
or formal supports. If you don't have a backup plan to stay at home, you are going to be at greater risk to go to a nursing home. And you don't want to go to a nursing home. I've never seen anybody raise their hand and say, yeah, I want to go to a nursing home. That's me. That's me. Sign me up. Nobody wants to go. So you want to make sure you think about this to have these things in place. And lastly, you have to have one or more of the clinical characteristics. And when I, may, when I say clinical, I mean that a Bay Path nurse comes out and evaluates you for clinical eligibility. So you need 24-hour supervision because of complex health conditions. You have a significant cognitive impairment, perhaps Alzheimer's disease or another dementia. You're unable to manage or administer prescribed medications. There are ways that you can stay at home and have medication management. We have medication administration machines. So uh, the bells and whistles go off at 10 a.m. which when you're supposed to take your next set of medications. There are things that are out there that can help you. You experience frequent episodes of incontinence. This makes you clinically eligible to go into a nursing home. But if you want to stay at home, you're going to need a laundry service because of your incontinence. And this goes back to how do we make a care plan and get a care plan together so that you are involved in the care plan, you have quality of life and, and, and dignity, and how can we help you achieve those goals in your last year? And finally, you re require daily supervision or assistance with multiple activities of daily living, which are bathing, dressing, drooming, eating, and continence. So what kind of services might you get on the frail elder waiver? Personal care, which is someone to help you bathe. A home health aide. A home health aide is a level above a personal care worker, and it means that you need more assistance, usually the help of someone, because you can't bear 50% of your weight. Many of these services are available in a regular state home care program, but when you are in that last year of life, you're going to look at all of these services and say, what is going to help me stay at home? What will enable me to either do it independently, support of a family member, support of a neighbor, without being a burden? Because if I can have a pill dispensing machine right next to my bed and a, and a water there, I can still take my pills by myself without my daughter coming over five times a day. That would be really helpful. So this is to keep in mind that you want to remain at home. There is a way to do it under Mass Health. In the Choices Program, technically we can provide services 24 seven. Now I say technically because we have, but we know there is a worker shortage. So it's very difficult to get workers in the house sometimes on the weekends. But that's your backup plan where family comes in. So think about this. Keep it in mind. And as I say, know us before you need us. And I will turn this back to Dr. Ricard or Arthur. Actually, I had Dr. Ricard come up early because I made an executive decision that she was better early than right now. But she's going to come back up very shortly. And I was going to talk about some of the things that I've often... I was going to talk about some of the things that I often talk about here regarding qualifying for these programs, but I'm really, I'm not going to, because I think, I think I want to make sure that you've heard, that we've had some more conversation about actually dealing with this last year of life. I'm just going to, I'm just going to mention two things. One, uh, as was mentioned earlier, you can qualify for all of those. Mary, right now, with the assets that she has, could qualify for all of these programs. She needs to do some asset restructuring, she needs to shift some money into something called a D4C pooled trust or buy an annuity. But the point is she could do all of these things. She could do all of these things. As a result, though, of not having planned ahead of time, um, at the end of her life, MassHealth will have a lien on these remaining assets to get repaid. That may still benefit her children because the, because the payments being made on her behalf will have been at a lower rate. But they would, but she could qualify for all of them. If she wanted to protect these assets at this point, now that Frank has died, if she controls them, she needs to give them away and wait five years. She needs to give them away and wait five years. She can give them to her kids. She can give them to a trust for the benefit of her kids. But that's the only way she can protect things, right? But I'm not going to go through this financial analysis because I want to talk about awareness of mortality. So in the last year of Mary's life, once again, this comes from the book, by the book. 
Um, there's a chapter called Awareness of Mortality. See if any of these ring a bell, and if they do, this, it's, it's time to think about this. Your doctor is talking about a serious illness or a terminal illness. You've got a vital organ that is, fail that is failing, heart, lung, kidney, brain, right? Bad memory. Um, early stages of an incurable disease. Uh, your doctor is saying, your pro won't even tell you your prognosis, but if you really make them, will say, well, you know, it's pretty bad, you know, it's kind of dire, right? Uh, the doctor is talking about your goals for care, not about cure. So at this point, it's about care and not about cure. So I wanted Dr. Ricard to talk about how she approaches folks, first of all, telling them that, this, that these may be the symptoms and it's time to t think about this stuff, and then talking about what to, where to go from here. Dr. Ricard. So I think the first thing is that <clears throat> I hope that I have seen this person leading up to this point so that I have gotten to know them, their family, how they're living at home. And I, I, I know them as a person, not just so-and-so with a bad heart, but so-and-so who loves dogs, who's done this, you know, whatever. I, I need to know them. Um, so that when I am approaching them and saying, look, you've got a really bad heart condition and the cardiologist is saying he's maybe giving us six months it's not just I'm not seeing them for the first time um, so <coughs> um, so we, co we come down to some of the things we talked about before what do you want to happen what do you not want to happen so if the, um, so it sort of gets us to the, this MOLST form a little bit, which talks about whether you want, for example, resuscitation or not. Um, does anybody here know what CPR is? Okay, good, good. Has anyone ever done CPR, taken the course? Or, okay. But <coughs> CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, refers to trying to get the heart started again once it has stopped. Now, we, everyone sees those TV things where someone has cardiac arrest, cardiac arrest, you know, and they come in and they do this, and miracle, the person sits up and said, what, what happens? Um, that's TV land. Um, in reality, unfortunately, and when I gave this talk a year or so ago on the MOLST form, I gave statistics that were related to um, people living in a nursing home. And the statistic was that <clears throat> people who go into cardiac arrest, who are in the nursing home setting, only about 15% survive. They go to the hospital where they go in the intensive care unit. And of those 15%, only about 15% leave. So it's a very, very small percentage. So um, I've since tried to look at data um, that's talking about people out there in the general public, and it hasn't changed very much. Um, if you're over 75, the chances of surviving a car, if your heart's, if you're in a car accident and your heart stops for some trauma thing, well, that's, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a natural event, if, if you will. If you're, if you're over 75 and your heart stops beating from a natural event, then it's a natural event. In other words, we can technically try and do things to bring that heart back, but we're doing a lot of damage to the body in, in the process. Um, CPR involves chest compressions, which means pressing down two inches. Can you imagine pressing down two inches on a person who's 90 years old? It doesn't sound good. And so the person who might survive has fractured ribs and maybe a, a hole in the lung and then pneumonia, all sorts of other things. So the cascade of bad things that happen uh, are not good. So when, when I talk to someone who is um, being given a bad prognosis and we're talking about do you want resuscitation, there are people that say, of course I want resuscitation, I don't want to die. I understand that, but the consequences of that procedure, are n this is what's going to end up, you're going to end up like, not even being as good as you are now. So just think about it. I, I don't, there's no right or wrong here, like Arthur said before. We're not trying to tell people what to do, but just give you the information so that you can make the appropriate decision. 
as to whether CPR is something that you would want to do. And it goes for a whole lot of other things that can be done in this, in this last year. Um, if you have bad lung disease, for example, COPD, everybody's seen those ads with the puffer and the, the, the wolf trying to blow the house down or whatever. <coughs> so if you have COPD and you're on oxygen, um, then your doctor needs to talk with you about how your life would be if you are taken to the hospital with very, very bad breathing situation and they want to intubate you, put a tube down into your lungs, hitch, hitch you up to a machine which then breathes for you. You need to review with the doctor what that means. What are the chances that you're going to come off this machine? Is this the way you want to spend the last few days or weeks of your life? Um, you know, is, is this what you want? Um, there are other things that doctors will talk to you about, like um, you probably heard the phrase what, that pneumonia is, um, is uh, the oldest elder's best friend, um, meaning that when you are in some terminal uh, medical condition, the, your immune system goes down. And we have all heard about immunity and trying to get immunity for shingles and immunity for colds. Immunity is what helps us fight infections. And when we, when we get older, all our systems begin to diminish. Um, so your reserve is down. You, we don't have the reserve. When, you, when you're young, you think of your reserve as a, as a box. And when you're young and you're in the middle of that box and something happens to you, you've got all this room to move before something really bad can happen to you. So you can come back. As we get older, this box shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. <laughs> and it's got a, um, a name called a homeostenosis. And stenosis just means that everything shrinks down. It gets stenosed, narrowed, small. So when you're older, your, your, all your systems, whether it's the heart system, the lung system, the skin system, whatever it is, you've now got a small box. So you're that little dot there in the middle of the box. And somebody knocks you over. You don't have far to go to reach the, end of the, to reach the edge of that box. So you, you don't have the ability to, to come back. So you have to think about this when the doctor is mentioning different procedures to you. And I was talking about pneumonia. And if you get pneumonia when you're frail and old, then yes, I could send you to the hospital, stick you with IVs, put a catheter in so that we know how much urine you're making and we've got tubes going in and everywhere. Um, is that the quality that you want? Or would you just say, OK, I've got pneumonia. Uh, I can give you something to help with the cough. I can give you something to help with the breathing. But this pneumonia could take you. I can give you antibiotics, if you like, by mouth. But this pneumonia may take you. And that I can help that be a comfortable thing for you to have. Even though it sounds terrible, we can treat pneumonia these days. Why aren't we treating it? And the granddaughter comes in and says, Grandma, Grandma, you know, I, why, why, are, why aren't we treating her for pneumonia? But it comes back to what that grandmother wants and what she has told. And that's why it's very important to have these advanced directives and these discussions with your caregiver as to what you want and with your doctor. And the doctor can bring the granddaughter aside and explain to her, I've had long chats with grandma. She's told me what she wants. And we're not, we're not going to treat this pneumonia if, if, that's, you know, if, if that's her decision. But all these things that your doctor tells you, as, as I think Doug mentioned before, you've got to ask why. What, what are the consequences of having the procedure? What are the consequences of not having the procedure? Having this treatment versus that treatment. Like Arthur mentioned with his um, friend there with, with cancer. She chose to have the treatment, but had anybody explained to her what the consequences of that treatment were going to be? That yes, maybe we could extend her life, but the quality would be different, you know, and would she, would she want that quality? So I think when, when, you get to that, when you get to that stage in life where you have six months or less or the doctor doesn't know how long you've got to, to go, then, you, then that's when you start really focusing on what your, what your goals were, what we talked about before. You want to be able to have a cup of tea with people. You don't want to be stuck in an ICU with a tube down your throat. 
you know, you, you want dignity, you don't want to have nurses and people coming in jabbing you all over the place. You want to be in your own, in your, in your bed, nice comfortable bed with music playing, hand massage, wh whatever it is you want. But um, like I said in the very beginning, you have control over this. But you, it does require a little bit of thinking and, and a little bit of planning and just talking to your caregivers and your physician. So. So just quickly, as a care manager, hope I, in the ideal world, I've been working with you f since you were 75, 70, 80, and we've been having a lot of these conversations about what your wishes are, what you want your life to look, about, look like. I've gotten to know you very well. I've probably gotten to know your kids really well. Um, and so at this point, really my job, as I see it, is to make these things happen. Make sure that your wishes are followed. So is that communicating with your doctor or helping you communicate with your doctor? If you're then, if you are on hospice, it's letting hospice know who you were. There was a client that we worked with who loved animals, was on hospice, mentioned how much she loved animals. They happened to have a therapy dog. The therapy dog was out there two days later. She was outside, which she loved sitting with the therapy dog and just in heaven. She is, by the way, off hospice now and doing really well. She's not in heaven. She's not in heaven. She's no longer in either of those heavens, but she is living her life at the assisted living facility where she was and doing quite well. So again, I guess that's a point that I always like to make is that hospice is not what we think of it. It's not a place that you go to. It's not you're absolutely going to pass in the next week or so. It's a service. It makes life better. It's all about quality of life. Of pe there, are, there are music therapists, there are companions that come in, chaplains, spiritual support, all kinds of different supports that make life better when you have hospice. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're dying in the next month. People live a long time on hospice, six months, a year, if they continue to qualify and sometimes people come off. So again, my, my role at this point is really to be your voice if you're not able to have that voice and make sure that your wishes are followed. And communicate, if your kids are in California, communicate with them, let them know what's going on. It's hard for you to communicate. I get to see you, I get to give reports. It gives everybody some peace of mind so your kids don't need to worry. So. Great, I'm, and I'm just gonna close with one point um, that. So, remember I always I said in a previous presentation, you only need really two documents. You need your health care proxy. We've talked a lot about that. It's really important so that if you can't be making these decisions, you're getting treated the way you want to be treated. You need that power of attorney. So suppose you haven't done all of this tremendous planning ahead of time to deal with how, what happens after you die in terms of your assets but you've given somebody your power of attorney. That person can do all of the asset switching around that you need to have done the day before you die. The day before you die. So suppose you just, you've wanted to keep control of your assets, you haven't put it into any kind of a trust, you just kept them. And now you've got a bank account, you've got your house, and you've got this will that says, oh, I really want everything to be divided equally among my kids when I die. Except that for that will to get, to get actually executed, you're going to have to go through the probate process and spend legal money and blah, 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 blah. One of the things you can do is just tell your child, your son or your daughter, who has the power of attorney, look, if I'm dying, if I'm really not doing well, so I don't need these assets anymore, I don't need, I'm not going to lose any sleep because they get distributed, just go distribute them. Do it right now. You have my power of attorney. Go cash out the bank account. Give the money to the kids. You've got my house, you've got a power of attorney, you can sign a deed on my behalf. Go deed the property to my kids. You probably wanna, on my behalf, keep a life estate for me so that when I die, there's still gonna be a jump in tax basis so when the kids sell the house, there won't be any capital gains tax. But the point is, this can be done the day before you die as long as someone has the ability to do it for you because you're not gonna do it because you're dying. You don't wanna be thinking about this stuff. It's just like the healthcare proxy when you wanna tell people in advance Here's how I want to be treated. You want to tell your person, your power, your, with your power of attorney in advance, this is what you do if you think I'm leaving, right? And maybe there'll be enough time. Maybe there won't, you know? 
but if there's enough time, you can save your kids a tremendous amount of aggravation, even if you didn't do all that advanced planning. That's it. Any questions for any of my wonderful panelists? I know we're running a little bit late. If not, can I have a round of applause for these wonderful people who are kind enough to come? Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this. We'll see you next year. Thank you.